Well, good morning. I'm Chad Stebbins from the Institute of International Studies, and I'd like to thank everyone for coming this morning. We have uh, 30 or so people in Corley Auditorium and another 25 plus watching via Zoom. So today is a very busy day for us with the Japan semester. We have this presentation by Dr. Culver coming up and then at 4.30 today, we're beginning a Taste of Japan event in the May's Student Life Cafeteria, all the Japanese food you can eat for $10. And then at, uh, that goes until seven. And then at seven o'clock tonight in Cornell Auditorium in Plaster Hall, we're showing our third film of the Japanese Film Festival, a classic called Tokyo Story. So busy day on tap for us. It's my pleasure to welcome our guest speaker this morning, Dr. Annika Culver is an associate professor of East Asian history at Florida State University, where she specializes in modern Japan and Northeast Asia related topics. She teaches one of the nation's only courses on North Korean history. Dr. Culver received her doctorate from the University of Chicago and has a master's degree in regional studies East Asia from Harvard. I think she's one of the most distinguished speakers we've ever had in conjunction with the theme semester. Since 2012, Dr. Culver has served as a scholar on the US-Japan Network for the Future, which connects academics to the foreign policy community. She has written numerous books and research articles on the Japanese empire. Dr. Culver regularly gives media and television interviews on East Asian topics, most recently for Voice of America, the New York Times, and Al Jazeera. She regularly presents at national and international venues. Professor Culver is proficient in Japanese, Mandarin, Chinese, French, and German. I've asked her to give today's presentation in English, however. This is the first of three Zoom presentations she will be giving as part of our Japan semester on Thursday at 9.30. She will be speaking on Japanese World War II advertisements and military care packages. And then on Friday, September the 24th, she will be speaking on the otaku culture, consuming, collecting, and comics in Japan from the 1980s to the present. So she's currently at her home in Tallahassee, Florida. Please give Dr. Culver a warm Missouri Southern welcome. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Stebbins, for that wonderful introduction. I'm very excited to be here to share with you some of my research. As you can tell, I have cherry blossoms behind me. And uh, even though it's not the correct season, it's definitely in honor of uh, this wonderful festival that you are holding. Amazing, amazing opportunity for everyone to take part. I really wish I could I could go to the, the dinner tonight. It sounds absolutely wonderful. Um, and um, anyhow, um, I'd like to share with you some of the findings of a research project that I've been engaged in literally since 2013. Um, the story of coming into these materials is absolutely fascinating. And um, it dates back to when I was a newly minted professor. I was working at University of North Carolina at Pembroke, which is a primarily Native American serving institution. It was, um, and now of course, um, they have broadened their focus uh, to include everyone, including lots of students from overseas. Um, they are part of uh, the Lumbee nation. Um, and so I was a new professor and I was standing in line and this was right at the time of the, um, the commencement ceremony. And I was standing next to a woman who was in the music department. And she said that her, her father had been the conversational English partner of the emperor of Japan. And I said, say what, really? <laughs> How does this happen? And then she's like, yeah, my dad was, um, my, my grandfather, um, was a member of the U.S. occupation of forces of Japan. And my dad went with him as one of his dependents. I thought, wow, this is a really fascinating story. 
these these connections are just unbelievable. And um, so I got to know her father, Tony Austin, quite well, and he donated a beautiful slide collection to Florida State University, where we were able to um, digitize all the slides. And of course, uh, this was um, an, another job that uh, I, um, I began at, um, which I've been at for about eight years. And so a lot of the images that you're gonna see are from that remarkable slide collection of a thousand color images of post-war Japan. Um, these are very, very rare because most people did not have access to color film at the time. Most Japanese did not. And so it was these foreigners who, who brought them like, um, like Tony Austin's father. Um, so anyhow, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about um, their lives and military dependents who went to Japan in the immediate post-war period. And um, here is the website called the Oliver L. Austin Photographic Collection where you can look at some of the images in more detail. Um, and um, You'll notice a bird there on the top of the screen. Um, and that's no accident because even though Oliver L. Austin, uh, who was an occupation official in Japan, even though he was a member of the military, he served in a civilian cap uh, capacity. Um, he was originally trained as an ornithologist. So his truly first love was birds, <laughs> but he also served as a kind of intelligence contact um, and you may have noticed the woman on the screen on the far left on the first slide, and that is Polly Spofford. Uh, she was in the OSS, which later was the CIA, um, and she was a frequent visitor at the Austin home. Um, we'll look at another bunch of very frequent visitors, um, and we'll also look at like what their home was um, in the kind of atmosphere. How did Americans live? in the space of um, this defeated population that now hosted them um, as um, essentially the victorious American conquerors. Uh, so um, this collection is, is just absolutely invaluable for understanding how the um, Americans viewed the Japanese right after the war um, and how Tokyo reconstructed the um, different environments of Japan at the time, uh, the defeated Japanese, um, all kinds of images of people from varying social class backgrounds. Um, and um, more interestingly, um, how, where, what were the spaces that these Americans moved in, around in? Um, and so these are some of uh, the images from the collection as well. Um, and you can see this, um, military official here, Oliver L. Austin, in the, the middle of these really wealthy, high-born Japanese elites. Many of them are aristocrats. Some of them are close to the imperial family. Um, and here is where we begin to see the connections to the former emperor of Japan. Uh, he's retired now. It's his son who's, uh, who's at, the, at the helm. Um, but um, his uh, positive connections with many of Japan's elites were able to turn um, the, uh, the soft power status of Japan as a formerly militaristic nation during the war viewed into one that's involved in peaceful efforts of conservation. Um, and interestingly enough, many of them had deep, deep fascinations for birds. Um, many of them, in fact, were ornithologists. And you wonder, why are all these aristocratic Japanese ornithologists? What is it about birds? Um, they love to hunt birds. They love to hunt birds for meat, for sport, and also to collect them, to name them and claim them and take species from all over the empire and, um, and codify them and thereby assert imperial control over these far-flung regions. Um, a very interesting person was uh, Hachiska Masauji. He's, he's um, shown here next to his um, secretary who he actually needed because he was, he was uh, half deaf, um, whether it was from hunting or from other, other reasons. Um, he traveled in the 1920s throughout Africa to hunt lions and um, was a really remarkable figure who had his own plane. And um, of course, during World War II was in a rather difficult position because he had married a Japanese American wife.
Um, I'm not going to talk too much about uh, him or her, but uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to share them. Um, and these are also um, very important individuals, uh, Kuroda Nagamichi and uh, Kuroda Nagahisa. Kuroda Nagahisa actually later works for the, the US military on biological research and also bird viruses and so on and so forth. Um, so that's another interesting post-war convergence. Um, I will talk about the US military and we'll talk about making a home for the US military. Um, but I just wanted to share with you some of these images. Um, I wrote a larger book called Japan's Empire's Birds, Aristocrats, Anglo-Americans and Transwar Ornithology will be coming out in the spring. Um, so if you wanna learn more about these stories, definitely check out the book. Um, and these are really fascinating stories of these individuals and their relationships with the Anglo-American world from literally the 1920s until the 1950s with the war being a break and um, how did they reconfigure their roles in the post-war period and how did they go from um, a kind of imperialistic use of science, uh, naming and claiming of bird species to conservation as a peaceful practice for a now uh, Japan active on the world stage using science for peace rather than science for war. And um, that kind of uh, brings us back to our discussion at hand, right? Um, you saw an image of um, an elite American military official who brought us all these intriguing photographs surrounded by aristocrats. He lived in the home of a former Japanese aristocrat. Um, and these were basically lodgings reserved for people in the upper echelons, top military brass. Um, Austin was at the level of Lieutenant Colonel, but yet how did ordinary families live? Uh, this is a really interesting question because um, Washington Heights was um, more of a kind of middle-class type of environment. Um, if you think of the 1940s and the 1950s in the United States, right after World War II, the construction of a new culture, a bright new culture, um, again, emphasizing peace, but also emphasizing conservative white American values uh, with a particular use of space that um, you'll begin to see in some of the other photographs I will show you. And these are from the Gordon Prang collections at the University of Maryland. Along with the, um, the NARA records from Washington DC, the national records, um, you can receive many interesting impressions from this collection. Um, and you can see the maps where the settlement of Washington Heights was located. And as you can see, uh, 827 houses with schools, a chapel, service facilities and all in the kind of latest modern aspects of American middle-class life imported and brought to Japan. Obviously many of the materials used were Japanese, but also centered around a chapel. Um, interestingly enough, uh, Toyama Heights, which is where when I lived in, in Tokyo and my son was going there to preschool, uh, Toyama Yochien is also um, the site of uh, the uh, Toyama Church. And it was built by General MacArthur on top of the ruins of the Army Medical College, which has kind of a nefarious role <laughs> during World War II because they were involved in biological weapons research. And I always kind of wondered what was going on in the basement of the church <laughs> because it looks so different from the actual church itself built in the early 50s. Um, and then as I was doing research for my book, I finally found out, well, there was a room for the emperor in the basement, uh, which had a beautiful ceiling. And it was because the emperor was often lodged in, in, um, in schools uh, in, um, in Japan because people did not want to lodge him in their homes because he was so sacred. And they were afraid they might not give him the proper hospitality. It's also a form of humbleness on the part of, of uh, Emperor Hirohito all the way going up to his grandfather, Mitsuhito in the Meiji period, the practice of keeping the emperors in schools um, if he cannot go back to the palace. Um, and uh, 
So for me, that was a really interesting discovery and how um, these conceptions of space under um, kind of during Japanese wartime um, were now changed. And of course, uh, the air raids uh, over Tokyo um, in the uh, spring of 1945 were especially devastated and especially areas where um, ordinary Japanese lived just completely were burnt down. And so there were actually all these spaces for um, the Americans to, to come in and construct homes. Uh, they began to come, come to Japan um, and this is the dependence of the American military um, at the end of 1946. Indeed, Austin's family took a long time to, to get there. The logistics of, of the move were, were quite uh, remarkable. And um, you can kind of see how these things are, are allotted, authorized dependent housing, um, and just how many and how massive this Washington Heights complex is. If you're wondering where is Washington Heights, if you ever go to Tokyo and you go to a park called Yoyogi Koen, that is exactly where it was located. In 1964, much of it was torn down to build a stadium for the 1964 Tokyo Olympics. There's literally one little house left, a tiny little house that's right at the edge of Yoyogi Park. Um, and Yoyogi Park is not too far away from the Harajuku area where uh, you can see the kids wearing the latest street fashions and um, some individuals will wear cosplay outfits on, on Sundays. So you can see them um, right at the entrance to that, that park um, as you go up Omoto Sando Dori um, and uh, go to the shopping areas or uh, wherever you wish. Um, and so it's just a massive, massive construction project of, of 602 rehabilitated houses um, for, of course, um, the Austin family. Um, there are also rehabilitated apartments, Amote Sando Dori. Um, there is a complex of apartments that literally dated from the 1920s. And it's still there. It's across the street from Louis Vuitton and the Tokyo Union Church, where we often go to church when we uh, are living or visiting in Japan. Um, and it's kind of smack dab in the midst of this fancy shopping area, which back then um, was uh, was not did not quite have the cachet that it has now. Um, but if you look at the new construction, right, Lincoln Center, Jefferson Heights, Washington Heights, and Grant Heights, these are all where more ordinary dependent American families are living. Um, and so you can just see there are thousands of places for uh, the um, Americans to to live. And this is what they looked like. And you might not think that this looks particularly American, but if you think of construction in California or in Hawaii, these are models. Um, in Florida, there are some homes that kind of look like this from the late 40s, the early 1950s, these little bungalows. And you can see the, um, the way the the bedrooms and, and living rooms are, are organized, uh, two, three, or four bedrooms. Um, and they're apportioned by rank. It's interesting, like everything in the military is very hierarchical, including the houses and where people are living. So larger homes are to captains, majors, and colonels. Now, if you get up into the, the colonel rank, you're definitely going to be housed in most likely a, a former aristocratic estate. Um, and the Japanese family that was living there usually went into the Japanese portion if it hadn't been burned down. Um, and the Americans would go into the Western portion. Most had both Japanese as well as um, Western style portions. So um, here are some more residential areas, uh, kind of condo-like apartments and a gas station. And this interestingly is the Akajipu or the red Jeep of the Austin family. And um, Dr. Austin went everywhere with red Jeep to 
go on his um, ornithological expeditions where he was going out into the Japanese um, different environments. His actual major task during the time of the occupation was to find new sources of protein for the Japanese population. He was with the natural resources section and he headed the wildlife bureau. Um, so they were looking at different kinds of um, ducks and chickens and even birds as sources of protein. And um, he came to the, the conclusion that songbirds were essentially being devastated in Japan for food because the people were hungry. They were using mist nets, which were very effective. These are now used everywhere in the world to ban birds, including here in Florida. But um, they were actually a Japanese invention and they were used uh, to catch these birds for food, for pets. Um, and also for raising them um, to sing songs, uh, to lure other birds or just for enjoyment in homes uh, traditionally. Um, and um, so he would use this, this Jeep just to get around. It was not supposed to be red, but they gave him a, be a, a Jeep of this, of this color. Um, it's actually only the, the fire, uh, the the um, fire authorities, anti-fire authorities that are supposed to drive a red Jeep, but nevertheless, um, they were not able to switch it or, or change uh, the color. Um, you can just see, interestingly, how uh, they're attempting to recreate an American atmosphere. You can see the American cars, everything is shipped over. It's just an amazing logistical challenge at this time. Um, and this is the officers club. None of this unfortunately still exists, but again, here's the, the red Jeep. You can see it being very distinctive. It's certainly a car for a, a scientist to be, to be driving. And the Japanese quarters, which look a lot more like they would be in Japan. You can also see people hanging their laundry outside, which is still a common scene in in Japan, though they have different devices on which to hang your laundry if you're an apartment dweller and, and you do it on your balcony. Um, and so you can see the quarters where Japanese lived. A lot more crowded, a lot more uh, with these kind of uh, so-called orientalist touches on the roof and its architecture. And this slide is one of my favorites because it says Doolittle Field on it. This is actually Hibiya Park. And this is right near the Imperial Palace. This was once a military parade ground for the Japanese. Um, a lot of space in there. Um, and um, uh, Higuchi Maki of the uh, Hibiya Park Library contacted me just a couple months ago to find out, well, what are the origins of this particular name? And I was pretty sure that it was from the Doolittle Raid and that it was an ironic name, right? Because there was the Doolittle Raid um, just one year after uh, the um, bombing of Pearl Harbor after the Japanese bombing of Pearl Harbor in retaliation. Um, certainly the Americans were not ready to engage in full-scale bombing attacks on Japan at that time, but it was meant to increase American morale and also frighten the Japanese at, at that particular time. And so I, I contacted Kana Jenkins, who is a librarian at the Gordon Prang collection, again, from the, the collection from which the images came from that I showed you of the kind of more ordinary style military housing for um, American dependents. Um, and um, she found that um, it was beginning, they were beginning to use that name um, in the uh, late forties in even Japanese newspapers. And so um, it kind of arose from a sort of uh, common parlance amongst just Americans themselves until they, they created this sign. Um, as a as a way like to say, okay, well, we won. <laughs> you know, um, Doolittle had his raid over Japan and um, now we are controlling Japan, right? We are occupying Japan and the occupation lasted for about eight years from 1945 to 1952. Um, but anyhow, uh, you can see here uh, just some of the scenery in American Jeep preparing to enter and um, a, a tiny little bike which um, is being pedaled by someone here. It's, it's a kind of a bike pulled um, 
what one would call Jean Rikisha a long time ago, um, but a person is, is riding the bike and then there are several people in the back. Uh, so this is a kind of taxi, kind of Japanese taxi, and you can see all the bicycles here. What's interesting too is uh, the city scenery was also taken over in part by the occupation. This is a very iconic building right here. It's the former uh, Wako department store, which you can still see. It, you can still see this iconic clock, which was um, put up there by the Seiko Corporation, really important Japanese watchmaking corporation uh, from 1932. Um, very Western style building, but it survived the air raids. Uh, much of the brick buildings in Ginza actually survived. So you can see here that uh, the business is already in operation. We're talking about the, the late 1940s. Um, but uh, observers also, they said, well, the, the streets were so filthy, uh, largely because of the, the ashes and the rubble still in some parts of the city that clung to people's shoes and their clothes. And you can see a man here who, I'm not sure exactly what he's doing, but he's a member of the military. He's still wearing his distinctive coat and hat from way back when. Um, people could not afford new clothing. And so the Japanese uh, civilians were in pretty tough shape. All of these barrack-like structures also, this is a black market. And one thing to keep this in context, this was the fanciest shopping area of Tokyo at the time. And literally it became an area filled with these kind of um, unregulated markets, which is essentially what the, the black market is um, called the, um, the yummy ishi. And what's interesting in the Wako department store, you could get very, very cheap liquor, about half the price that it cost in the United States at the time. And um, Japanese women who um, were called panpan girls who engaged in relationships with US servicemen, fraternizing at one point was not allowed, but later the occupation authorities relaxed the rules. Um, they would often receive liquor in payment and then they would sell it back on the black market because they preferred the cash. So um, interestingly enough, you had these two uh, things coexisting, right? The American military PX compared to, to this. I'm not sure if any of you have actually been to a PX. I've, I've seen one in Okinawa. It's, it's quite remarkable. I mean, it looks very American, it has all these American stores in it, uh, American franchises for fast food and, and the like. It's, it's absolutely fascinating. And um, more images of the, the black market from kind of behind and looking onto um, one of the key department stores in Japan. Uh, this one here, Takashi Maya, is a flagship department store, again with the Aka Jeepu, or the red Jeep right in, in front, Austin's um, distinctive conveyance. And you can see Japanese former military veterans wearing, again, their unique clothing. This, to me, looks like it's in the winter, so it's probably in December of 1946, which is um, when Austin actually began to expect his, his family to come. And here we are, uh, here's the family. This is uh, Dr. Austin, his uh, son, Tony, who later became the conversational partner of the former Japanese emperor Akihito. And this is um, his son, Timmy. And Timmy actually engaged in wrestling matches <laughs> with the crown prince. Luckily, for the sake of U.S.-Japan relations, the emperor won <laughs> and bested him. Well, the crown prince at the time. This here is Yuki. And Yuki is actually a pedigreed Japanese dog that um, was rescued from its owners who could no longer afford to feed him. And this was often the case. A lot of these American families they um, received the largesse of their, um, you know, surrounding um, Japanese uh, hosts. And um, he also, interestingly enough, had six servants, which is quite 
surprising for many of you to hear, but uh, this was emblematic of his social status and um, official status in the US military apparatus at the time. Um, apparently um, for some high ranking military uh, stationed in places like Thailand, um, even more towards the contemporary period, having servants was, was fairly common. And um, you can see down here, uh, this is Elizabeth Austin. She is the wife of Oliver Austin and um, she loved to go to these little bazaars and collect antiques, uh, kanzashi, the, the hairpins that uh, Japanese women favored. And you can kind of see the distinctive hairstyles of Japanese women in the occupation. Um, having braids and putting them in a crown around one's head was kind of a, a very popular hairstyle at the time. Actually, Frida Kahlo in the 1940s, you can see that on her as well. Um, but this was common for American women at the time if you had long hair as well. Um, the bob that uh, Elizabeth Austin is, is sporting as well. Um, and you can see their, their clothing is, is really relatively formal. Um, I believe that the Austins up here are going to um, a, a wedding or some other occasion. So they're wearing their suits, uh, but they are just out shopping. And this is their home. And you are probably really amazed by how Western it looks. Um, the outside of the home, which you'll see in just a moment, looks almost completely Western. But inside there are these kind of distinctively Japanese features, like for example, the walls uh, with the, um, the wood um, in between it. It looks kind of like Tudor, but it's actually um, just the way it, it was uh, built. Um, and then you can see the, the Japanese bath, the ofuro, and a heater right here because um, central heating was still a big thing, even for these Western style houses. And of course there was no air conditioning in most places at the time. Um, here's an element of um, kind of American middle-class life, the, the Christmas tree at the time, complete with tinsel and lights and, um, <clears throat> they wanted to have a American style Christmas that they could actually show the crown prince uh, later emperor. And he came in and celebrated Christmas with them. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm gonna take a drink of water. <coughs> Sorry about that. But um, they came up with, um, with an actual Christmas tree. Um, it's described in Elizabeth Vining's um, I, uh, iconic book about um, the crown prince. Uh, Elizabeth Vining was a Quaker tutor to um, uh, Akihito at the time. And um, she was the one who sort of brokered this language exchange. Interestingly enough, another visitor to their home was General MacArthur's son. Um, interesting, his name is Arthur MacArthur. Um, he's born in 1938, but um, Tony believes that he possibly took another name to just separate himself from the fame of his, his father um, and that he possibly lives in New York right now. Uh, we're not exactly sure because uh, he's probably going by another, another name. Um, but he was part of their Cub Scout den in the, um, the Austin home. So they're manufacturing these really sort of American institutions like the Boy Scouts, um, you know, um, at that time, large numbers of Americans were, were Christians and the Austins in particular, they were white um, American um, Protestants. Um, otherwise known as wasps, they were from the Northeast. They were otherwise known as Yankees. And so they came from this very elite background. Um, I believe they were Episcopalians, but um, Oliver Austin, in fact, did donate his body to science. So I don't think he took much stock in, in religion. <laughs> um, he ended up at University of Florida as a um, curator of birds at the Florida Museum of Natural History, which is actually um, a wonderful natural history museum. It's not just about birds and butterflies. If you go and visit now, it's, it's quite a remarkable uh, just museum in 
in general, um, kind of like a small version, a tiny version of the Smithsonian with great exhibits, um, wonderful butterfly collection, and you can go to the butterfly jungle. Um, but he was curator of ornithology there uh, during his last days. That's where we have the Florida connection. Um, but kind of back to these elements of Americana that were imported into Japan, into these Japanese aristocratic spaces. Um, you can see uh, Elizabeth Austin reading the paper. This is kind of a Sunday scene that you might see in the United States as, as well. Uh, so they tried to maintain similar schedules that they had uh, back in... Um, back in their, their home country. Um, and even some of the decor looks very similar to 1950s upper-class homes, just the way that um, the, I'm not sure why there's a little bit of, uh, that these things are a little bit off kilter, but uh, maybe it's just the angle of the, of the photograph. Anyhow, this is the outside of their home. Um, and this was a requisition house. So you have this really nice, beautiful, tiled, large Western style home. Um, and then towards the right here is a Japanese portion. Um, these homes have a lot of land. And so many of them were able to avoid the fire bombings because servants were able to, um, some, in some cases, remove the incendiaries before they could cause damage. Um, and uh, you can see there's even a carport for the the Aka Jeep, the red Jeep. Um, and uh, the, um, the house was the estate of Ariyoshi Yoshia, who was the son of Ariyoshi Chuichi. So um, Ariyoshi Yoshia was the former mayor of Yokohama. Um, Yokohama was one of the first treaty ports after Japan was opened. Uh, for trade in 1858 by the Harris Treaty of, of, of Commerce. Interestingly enough, um, Ariyoshi was also the president of Keijo University, which is located in Seoul. So he's part of these colonial elites. He's a, he was a, a former colonial administrator. And um, <clears throat> so the... Um, the wife of Ariyoshi Chuichi still lived on the premises, um, an elderly woman um, in this Japanese villa here. <coughs> I'm sorry, my mouth is really dry. But um, so um, many of these Japanese elites actually had summer homes. And so they had the opportunity to move elsewhere should their um, Tokyo-based homes be requisitioned by the American occupation authorities. But as you can see, I mean, this is a fabulously large house. And um, just interestingly enough, um, very similar to wealthy American suburbs in major cities like New York, for example. Um, but again, um, these aristocrats were also cosmopolitan elites. And um, uh, there's going to be a couple of photographs, I think, of, of the neighbors, um, but the neighbors were the Nakatas. And the Nakatas have lived in New York City, interestingly, only a few streets down from Elizabeth Austin, who came from a very wealthy family uh, who ran the Schlings florist, um, a fancy floral enterprise that delivered flowers to debutantes and, and others, uh, people going off on voyages on ships would send each other bouquets and all kinds of arrangements that they could put in their cabins. Uh, back then, it took a while to get somewhere on a ship. You couldn't just go off on a plane and and travel in um, a few hours, you'd get to Europe or if, uh, half a day you'd get to Japan. No, it would, it would literally take a, a long time. Um, nowadays, it takes about a week to get to Europe on a ship from uh, New York, but back then it took even longer. Um, it took a month actually almost for the Austins to take their ship from San Francisco all the way to Tokyo. They took the USS Brewster. It was a horrible experience because they were caught in heavy winter weather on the Pacific. Um, now we're heading into, actually we are in hurricane season here in, in Florida and elsewhere in the Atlantic, uh, but the Pacific has its own times when travel can be very, very rough. Um, but 
let's go back and take a look at the individuals who staffed this family. Uh, Kurosawa Shoji is, is really interesting because he's literally Oliver Austin's assistant. And um, he provided Austin with important research uh, skills um, in ornithology. Um, and he actually worked with him at Suwon in Korea. And he was able to be found in Tokyo when he was able to repatriate to Japan uh, by the US military police. And so um, actually all six of these servants, um, they, they cooked, they cleaned, uh, they took care of the house, they took care of the grounds. Um, I believe I have only about, um, I know we started a little bit late, we have about 10 more minutes, so I'm going to accelerate a bit. Um, this is what the kitchen looked like, um, very different from nowadays, it's quite antiseptic. They had a great big lister bag here, which was intended to uh, purify the water, and you put tablets in it to make the water safe to drink. And... Uh, just to ensure that the Japanese servants knew how to cook what the Americans liked, um, Oliver Austin's wife, Elizabeth Austin, she wrote The American Way of Housekeeping. Uh, this here is one of the more um, recent editions, but it went through multiple editions. It was wildly popular. Um, this was one of the oldest editions from literally 1948, um, and it tells how to care for the Americans. Um, by the way, this is a salmon. These are deviled eggs. These are um, potatoes and peas. So this is what Americans ate back in the 1950s. And this was considered to be very fancy cuisine. I believe this is a type of a, a sauce. I'm not sure what this is. This might be a jello dish. Jello was a big deal back in the late 40s and early 50s. <laughs> but dessert or salad with jello was just absolutely um, de rigueur on the tables of, uh, of uh, people back then. Um, the book always indicated what one, how one should care for the Americans themselves. Like never under any circumstances give a patient or a child under your care any Japanese food. <laughs> Um, interestingly, I, I think this was possibly related to fears of uh, potential um, sanitation because vegetables and the like were fertilized with human manure back in the day. And um, so it wasn't that Japanese food was in any way inferior. And in fact, Japanese aristocrats ate the same thing that the Westerners did because they were so influenced by Anglo-American cooking traditions because of their travels and um, even Emperor Hirohito ate a full British breakfast with bangers and mash, which is actually uh, mashed potatoes and um, sausages. Um, but uh, this also kind of uh, represents the ideas of the Americans um, in kind of implementing their superiority of their way of life. Um, and um, also appliances that they came with, like the vacuum cleaner. Mechanized appliances were a huge deal. In the 1950s, this would be something that uh, Japanese families would avidly purchase and covet and save up for, especially vacuum cleaners um, and any type of these new electric appliances. And so care for children was also very important. Um, and then you can also see the layout of, um, of how, uh, the, the cleaning closet, this is a little bit off kilter, but what should a cleaning closet look like is really fascinating. All right, I'm trying to move forward here. Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, all right. Yes. Um, anyhow, uh, just to conclude, um, there was a difference between the ranks of the American military members in occupied Japan. Obviously, those of a high rank lived in the very same spaces that their defeated Japanese counterparts had lived in. And um, Washington Heights, Grand Heights, and other areas 
were kind of a recreation of 1950s white American life um, with all the uses of spaces and the attempt to just uh, generate surroundings very much like what the Americans were familiar with along with um, their own schools. Um, there were also those private schools that emerged like the Tokyo American School, otherwise known as the American School in Japan, uh, which is my what, where my advisor at University of Chicago went to, Norma Field. Um, her father was an American serviceman and her mother um, was, uh, was Japanese. Um, and so of course there were also a lot of these marriages and um, the women and their husbands, they went back to the United States. Um, and at a time, uh, even before the civil rights movement. And so they encountered these um, interesting notions of, of race, right? Because people were like, well, what are they? I mean, are they, are they white? Are they colored? Now, how do we fit them in? Especially people in the South. And so they were viewed as honorary whites, but yet, um, on the West Coast, Japanese Americans had largely experienced internment. And so that was another layer of um, this kind of difficult relationship with how to, um, how Americans accepted um, people of Japanese descent at, at the time. Um, not to go into that in too much detail, but Margaret Dalloway wrote a fascinating book called um, The um, American, um, I think it was called The American, a housewife or the American way of housewifery um, about that very notion. Um, and it wasn't use, the book wasn't just useful for the servants, but it was also useful for these young women who married um, American um, men from the military um, so that they could literally learn how to care for their husbands. And there are intriguing pictures of occupation of, of, of uh, American women from the occupation teaching uh, Japanese, young Japanese women literally how to vacuum the floor. And um, I mean, it's, they're just remarkable photographs because the American women are generally much taller and the Japanese women are much shorter. And so uh, these implications of, of power are also really significant just in the, in the visuals. Um, so in terms of the role of the archive, the role of photographs, photographs are so important because they can show us things about class, race, gender, and national identity when the entire social economic and political system of Japan experienced a drastic reordering under US auspices. Um, in subsequent military bases, such as, uh, there's a very, very large one um, in South Korea now, um, there are also these attempts to recreate American life in um, spaces such as apartments. Um, the PX, of course, is just like an American shopping mall and, and so on and so forth. But the context for Japan is much different because you have the Americans coming in as the post-war conquerors who are trying to fashion the Japanese into um, new democratic actors under their tutelage with a post-war constitution in 1947, women can vote, um, and the Japanese have formally renounced war in that constitution. Of course, it was written by the Americans, but um, the, um, as you saw, the thousands of military dependents that came into Japan at the time were very important and pivotal in kind of showing Japanese the American way of life, uh, which was even enshrined in one of these books. So thank you for listening. And um, if we have a few minutes for questions, I'd be very happy to take, take your questions. Are there any questions? I'll ask one. Uh, how did the Japanese feel about the allies who had bombed them and conquered them, defeated them? Were there any uh, hostilities expressed? Well, yeah, of, of course. <laughs> but um, again, um, what these elite men that I, I showed you in the previous photographs, um, who were scientists, believed was that they had this expedient chance to become friends or colleagues with Oliver Austin, and that would help them to restart their careers and to regenerate these Anglo-American connections that literally spanned the transwar period. Um, and one, uh, Kuroda Nagahisa, actually started to work for the US military laboratories in Tokyo near Yurakusho, the 406th. Um, and uh, 
literally he was collaborating with the Americans, like the, the people who had defeated him when beforehand he had worked for the Japanese military in a similar capacity. So, um, and of course, uh, you know, the, the local population, those who did not speak English, those who were not very Westernized, um, saw the Americans with, with great envy, um, sometimes as business opportunities. I mentioned um, the Pan Pan girls. This is literally what they were called at the time, um, enterprising young women who offered sexual services or just plainly relationships to the American servicemen um, in exchange for, for food, for nylons, other items um, that they could sell. Um, and in some cases, um, servicemen uh, engaged in um, amicable relations with uh, young Japanese women that ended up in marriage, such as uh, Norma Field's father and mother. Um, and uh, so it ranges the wide gamut. I mean, these people are survivors. They literally... Um, experience some of the worst bombing campaigns from 1944 onwards, um, including two cities uh, bombed by atomic bombs. Um, most were extremely happy and relieved that the war was over. Um, Samuel Yamashita, who is a professor at Pomona College, he wrote a wonderful book about daily life in wartime Japan. Um, that explore some of these emotions that Japanese had. Um, the US uh, Strategic Bombing Survey also talks about how Japanese had really lost confidence in their political leaders. And so the American occupation was also an opportunity for them to restructure their society, um, to allow the so-called bright life to reemerge. That's akarui seikatsu, that's an actual term from that time period. Um, and so resentment and fear slowly began to, um, to transform into um, just what 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 are the potential opportunities of alliances with the conquerors? Um, Shibusawa Naoko's book *America's Geisha Ally* really covers that. Um, and from jobs with the occupation, you could get access to more food, more money. Um, highly coveted jobs these were. Um, unemployment was absolutely awful right after the war. And you can imagine with the devastation and, and so on and so forth as well. Questions from the audience? Would you, uh, Dr. Culver, would you check and see if there are any questions from our Zoom audience? Yeah, I see, um, I, it says more. I see like a little number one. Um, you know what, if I get out of, if I escape out of my screen share, maybe I can see it. I, I know there's one in chat. Okay, stop share. I will do stop share because that will be helpful in getting there. Okay, stop share. Uh-oh, I cannot stop share. Oh, yes. Okay, Maya Greenquist. I graduated from the American school in Japan. Uh-oh. Hello? Okay. We can um, still can hear you. Me? Okay, good. Um, this is from Maya Greenquist. She said, I graduated from the American school in Japan in 2020, and most of my friends lived on the military base in downtown Tokyo. Do you happen to know if the events of 311 caused any destruction to what is left of Washington Heights? Um, in fact, the Tokyo Olympics of 1964 caused the most destruction to Washington Heights. Um, 311 was really, really devastating, mostly to northern Japan um, and um, the areas near the coast. So um, if you go to Fukushima, which is up to the northeast of um, Honshu, the larger island, um, that received the brunt of everything, including the nuclear reactor that melted down because of the, the tsunami. Um, but yeah, Tokyo was, was okay. Um, people were really freaked out by the radiation though. Um, and um, there's really just one little building left of Washington Heights um, in Yoyogi Park. So you can still go and, and see it if you want. But I visited your school in 2015. I had a wonderful time. They showed me, um, I went to the, the um, newer campus, obviously not, it's certainly different from where it was way back when um, the, uh, the Austin kids went there, so. 
Uh, I had a question. Um, with the practice of collecting birds in aristocratic circles, was there any relation to European nobility and ar aristocracy collecting exotic animals in the 17th, 18th century or 18th and 19th centuries? Oh, oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, it's interesting, Jean de la Cour, he's a French aristocrat. He had the um, this famous zoo in Clare, which is outside of Paris. Um, Lord Rothschild, who is a fantastic character, he's British and, and um, he's actually one of the few Jewish peers in um, the British nobility. And he had this huge estate called Tring. And again, he has his own zoo, um, including cassowaries, which is a very odd bird. It's a giant bird, like an ostrich. They're very aggressive. He used to have them roaming around on the grounds, but then he had to put them in a barn of, of a type. Um, he had a carriage of zebras. Uh, he also had a um, Galapagos tortoise <laughs> wandering on the grounds. And he was really good friends with Hachiska Masauji, who visited Rothschild in his um, Tring estate because he was going to University of Cambridge in the 1920s. And so they all knew each other. Delacour, in fact, um, was very good friends with uh, Prince um, Takatsukasa Nobusuke, who was um, later in 1944 and beyond the head of the Meiji Shrine. And um, he was an expert in parrots and loved parrots and loved collecting parrots. Um, of course, um, Delacour had some on his estate as well, but, but yeah, collecting animals, exotic animals from all different places, including um, if you go back in time, the shogunate also had animals brought into Japan by the Dutch. So we're talking about 1603 to 1868. Um, the shogun even had an elephant come into Japan. <laughs> And uh, so these large megafauna were extremely important as, uh, as cultural exchanges, as gifts from wealthy individuals or, or uh, powerful individuals from foreign countries. They were also imperial gifts. Like when Japan developed its empire, um, its, its scientists or collectors scoured the empire. Uh, like Hachiska would go and hunt for lions and he had all kinds of trophies of of um, African animals inside of his his uh, seaside home in Atami, um, and uh, yeah, so they're they're very much part of that tradition. Um, I got to see Emperor Hirohito's cabinet of birds at the Yamashina Ornithological Institute. It was really very interesting. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Oh, two more. Q&A questions from the Zoom audience. Okay. Ah, okay. Let me see. Um, all right. Uh, okay. Um, West Germany and the U.S. were largely able to reconcile after the war due to mutual fear of the USSR and by working together during the Berlin airlift. Is it fair to say the same of Japan and the US? I know that the USSR occupied the Japanese Kuril Islands, which they probably didn't like. Um, interestingly enough, uh, there are still issues unresolved with Russia today, right? I mean, the Soviet Union fell a long time ago um, between 1989 and 1991, uh, finally ended in the early 90s um, and now is, is, is Russia. But um, the fear of the Soviet Union, definitely the Cold War was extremely important. And in fact, led uh, people like Kuroda Nagahisa to work with um, the Americans on projects that later intersected with um, bioweapons research, uh, Fort Detrick. Uh, for example, uh, Kuroda and Elliot McClure, um, in the early 50s, they went hunting for birds to do research on Japanese encephalitis, which was a big problem there. Um, and so they would take blood samples and they sent them back to Fort Detrick. So, <laughs> um, which was built during the war as a bioweapons research facility. So we know that the Russians are doing the same thing as well um, at uh, their facility, which is later known as Biopreparat, 
um, which becomes defunct in the early 90s. And then its scientists, at least the head of it, um, went to the United States, Ken Elibic. Um, definitely read his book, Biohazard, because it's really fascinating. Um, and you know, we had all these questions about um, a, a possible leak or whatever happened. Um, and um, Alibek, of course, talks about that in the context of the Soviet Union. If you're a big Soviet Union history buff, definitely read that. Um, but yeah, the, the concern over the Soviets and, and working with these new American allies, um, the Japanese military was always concerned with the Soviet Union. The Japanese Navy was more concerned with um, the Americans, interestingly enough. Um, and so there's some kind of historical continuity there. Okay, um, what important actions did the empire take during this, during, did the emperor take during this time period? Yeah, um, Hirohito is interesting uh, because he was a scientist and um, Oliver Austin never met him personally. He got to go and see his lab because um, the Showa emperor, he was a marine biologist. Um, he imparted the love of science to his son, um, Emperor Akihito, Akihito, who became a specialist on Gobi. Gobi is a type of fish, G-O-B-Y. Um, and there's also actually some fish that was named after him in his honor. And uh, so um, what's fascinating, what happened to Emperor Hirohito was the Americans made a conscious decision not to have him go up for trial at the so-called Tokyo Trials because they wanted to maintain him as an important symbolic figure to keep the Japanese united at a crucial time. So 1947 or so, we have the reverse course, which is um, a much more conservative approach going from a New Deal type of liberal progressive approach to reordering the democracy of Japan, including radical land reform, literally radical land reform that the aristocrats were not happy about because their tenant farmers were all of a sudden able to purchase the land for very, very cheap prices from the government. Um, and then um, in 1947, uh, the Americans wanted to create a bulwark against communism. And so their steering of democracy had a very different flavor after 1947. Um, and the emperor became a kind of a, a, merely a figurehead, but he did have to, after the national diet, which is their legislature, enacted laws, he did have to provide his final seal of approval, but that's just cosmetic. That's like the third thing that has to be done. Um, the Japanese people, they have to vote 50% majority on any type of new law. Um, and which um, two thirds of the, the Japanese diet before that had to, had to ratify. Um, and then the final step is that the Japanese um, emperor kind of signs that law into action, which most people forget about, but that's what he does. Any final questions, either from the live audience or the Zoom audience? Let me see, open. Well, thank you, Dr. Culver, for an excellent presentation. And we will see you again Thursday at 930 Central for your talk on Japanese World War II advertisements and military care packages. So okay. enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Looking forward to it.